Hi, this is Albert van Dijk, and in um, this little video, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, non-optical remote sensing methods and um, give you a brief introduction of some of the methods we'll talk about later on uh, and a slightly longer uh, description of some um, methods that we won't see uh, that much after this. So, just to remind you, here is a, uh, a fairly complicated diagram showing the, uh, the continuum of the electromagnetic spectrum, the frequency uh, and the uh, inverse of the frequency, as we talked about before, those two uh, uh, frequency and wavelength, they are related through the uh, speed of light. And um, I guess uh, what I want to draw your attention to is, so far we've been talking about visible remote sensing uh, mainly, which is in this little area here. Uh, we talked a little bit about near-infrared, so here's a blow-up of that little area. Uh, we've, so we've spoken about near-infrared, which um, we tend to uh, lump in with visible uh, light because we can measure it in the same sort of way. We measure reflectance of, uh, of sunlight. So we tend to use uh, near infrared uh, in, in similar ways as we use um, optic, uh, visible light. What you also see in this diagram is that the infrared spectrum goes well beyond that. Uh, we've got uh, the mid infrared or mer, the thermal infrared, or ter, and we call that thermal because that's where um, the Earth emits most of the time and that's in that uh, uh, where the maximum is. Uh, as we talked about previously, um, Planck's law tells you that uh, for temperatures um, commonly found on Earth, the peak uh, emission will be in this sort of range. Uh, and uh, then we've got far infrared and beyond that microwave. Now in this um, video, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about microwave, but there's another video where I talk more about passive microwave measurement uh, so there we measure emissions from the Earth as well as radar, which is the active equivalent uh, of, um, of microwave remote sensing, where we emit microwave radiation and measures how much of it comes back. Uh, and also, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the X-ray side of this of the uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, this is a useful diagram, I think, um, just to stare at for a little bit longer because uh, it gives you a sense of of the continuum and how the different uh, uh, features in the um, electromagnetic spectrum are used. And um, as you can see, there's some unusual naming uh, for uh, radar bands that are also used for passive microwave remote sensing, and we'll, we'll come back to that later. But by the way, there's two terms in this diagram that really, uh, one of them shouldn't be there at all, and one of them is um, put in the wrong place, I think. So I'd be interested uh, to, uh, to see if you uh, quickly can spot which term they are. All right, so microwave remote sensing. I'll talk a little bit about that, but as I said, there's a separate uh, video on that. But the main thing to remember is um, we've got the thermal infrared region, as we'll talk about in a different video, and then a big part of the spectrum is not really used at all from, uh, uh, for space-based remote sensing because the atmosphere absorbs pretty much all the radiation. Uh, and then uh, uh, at some point at a lower frequency again, uh, we start to uh, be able to get a signal, if you like, uh, of emitted radiation from the Earth again. And um, and so that's the region that most of our passive and active methods tend to focus because for active methods that's also where you lose the least energy when you uh, emit uh, active uh, radiation. And as you can see there are other parts of the spectrum, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet. Uh, it says here uh, uh, it's blocked by the upper atmosphere and so you best observe it from space. Uh, that of course uh, uh, means that uh, that's if you're interested uh, to measure what comes from outer space, because if you want to know what comes from the Earth, then obviously uh, that's the worst place to be. The closer to the Earth, the more you're going to be able to measure. Um, and uh, we'll come back to that in a second. So here's the um, the band uh, notation, uh, uh, as it's uh, usually called, for the microwave spectrum. And as you can see, there's some uh, unusual letter coding in it, so you might know from uh, if you're a radio amateur or something like that, you might have heard of UHF and VHF. So that stands for ultra high frequency and very high frequency. Uh, but then we've got a sort of an eclectic number, uh, a set of of, uh, of um, uh, symbols or, or, or letters. So uh, K comes from the German Kurz, uh, there's a, a military background uh, to that, uh, and then uh, the uh, KUs for a, a slightly uh, longer and Ka for a slightly shorter wavelength, and so on. So um, this can be a bit confusing when you talk about X band or C band 
radar or exponential human passive microwave remote sensing because it doesn't immediately tell you what wavelength or frequency there is. You're going to have to look that up or try and memorize that a little bit uh, if that's uh, useful for, you, for uh, what you're doing. Um, you also see some of the applications here. So we'll be mostly talking about passive and active um, uh, microwave remote sensing in Ka to L bands. Uh, but if you look at uh, uh, astronomy, telecommunication, they tend to work in, uh, in uh, longer wavelengths than that. And here's one example of a, uh, a mission, the soil moisture uh, uh, active passive mission that uh, was uh, launched last year uh, and um, uh, uh, which has the unique feature of having both an active and a passive microwave sensor on board. Unfortunately, the active sensor has uh, since failed, uh, so essentially it's only a passive microwave sensor at this point, as you see with a very large uh, uh, antenna. Um, so we, we, um, we, we cannot actually get uh, active measurements from this uh, satellite, but it's interesting that it's the first satellite actually combined these two measurements. So that's all we're going to talk about for the microwave part of the spectrum uh, for, for this, uh, this uh, little video. Uh, at this end, we've got the gamma rays, and as you saw before, most of that is absorbed uh, by the atmosphere, uh, and, but if we fly low enough with, uh, with aircraft, then we can still measure uh, in that, uh, in that uh, wavelength. And that's um, what, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, mineral exploration companies do a fair bit, and, and geological mapping services, because what you can do is you can look at the specific uh, emission spectra of different uh, radioactive isotopes. So naturally, rocks have radioactive isotopes, uh, and when those isotopes uh, degrade to a lower energy form, they emit uh, gamma ray radiation at low frequency. So it's not particularly dangerous to to us uh, uh, normally, but um, it's enough to be measured and enough to do some geological mapping. So you can sort of uh, see from this uh, mosaic here of of airborne gamma ray measurements as we put together by Geoscience Australia, uh, how the different rocks and, and mineral compositions lead to different combinations of, uh, uh, in this case, of the potassium, uranium, and thorium, um, uh, typical emission spectra from those three elements. And you can uh, uh, already see that you know, some clear features stand out, and this is, of course, useful for geological mapping. You don't have the vegetation to worry about. Then the last um, uh, non-optical uh, and unusual, you could say, remote sensing method um, I wanted to uh, introduce is satellite gravimetry. And that's pretty unique because so far uh, all the methods that we've seen uh, are remote sensing methods that use electromagnetic radiation, either the emitted and measure what comes back, active methods, or they measure uh, how much of the uh, emitted radiation uh, from natu natural sources. Uh, is uh, is observed, but this myth mission is quite a bit different. So, this mission we've got two satellites, uh, uh, the nicknamed Tom and Jerry, who chase each other in orbit around the Earth, and with a, a laser beam, they measure the distance uh, between each other uh, extremely accurately uh, within the uh, a tenth of a, of a, of the width of a human hair, and that's quite an achievement when you consider that these two satellites are about 220 kilometers apart. So how does that work, and what, and, and, and what is it good for? Well, consider a cyclist going, uh, going up a mountain uh, and, uh, and another one coming down a mountain. So the, the cyclist going up the mountain has uh, got the uh, gravity working against him. He's been pulled back, if you like, by gravity. So he'll be going up the mountain um, much slower and, and, and in, a, in a horizontal sense, make less progress than the cyclist going down the mountain, which is gravity working for him and can uh, uh, make meters uh, uh, far faster than the uh, the other cyclists. So the horizontal distance, if you like, between these cyclists will be increasing at this point as this one is held back and that one is, is pulled forward, if you like. And that's exactly how these gray satellite, uh, satellites work. Of course, they don't climb mountains, uh, but they do fly over through the net of their orbit uh, areas of the Earth that have greater and lesser uh, gravity attraction. So here's a, a, a little uh, clay ball sort of um, a model that shows in red areas that have relatively high gravity fields uh, and uh, in blue those areas that have relatively low gravity fields. And as you can imagine, that's got to do with um, how thick the Earth's crust is and, and that sort of stuff. So 
mountain ranges, of course, uh, as you see here, <coughs> will typically have higher uh, gravity fields. Um, but the interesting thing is, is by continuously measuring uh, those gravity fields that, uh, from day to day or from week to week, uh, month to month, then you can start seeing temporal variations. So the gravity field is not a constant, but a change over time. And that's not so much about the geology, uh, but that's more because of uh, um, changes in, uh, in, uh, in water storage and in ice uh, and, and such, you know, more dynamic changes at the Earth's surface. Uh, and that's very interesting. So, for, for example, some applications uh, of this satellite have, have been developed, and an important one is that we can look at how much uh, ice is lost at Antarctica, as of which in this uh, top graph here, uh, and in Greenland, which you see the, the bottom graph. So you see clear signal of how over time, since the launch of the GRACE satellites in 2002, there's a, there's a steady depletion, a steady loss, melt of ice at uh, both of the poles. We can also look at groundwater depletion. So for instance, um, a couple of years ago, it was a, 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 the first study, and since there have been many more, looking at how, for instance, in India, groundwater extraction for irrigation leads to rapidly declining water tables. And you see sort of in the blue colors here uh, where, where most of the extraction has occurred. We can also look at things like uh, droughts and floods and other hydrology uh, sort of processes. Uh, and that's what you see in the top graph here. So you see the the, the season uh, here in the Amazon, for instance, where uh, in uh, in red you see the wet season uh, uh, progressing, and in blue the dry season. And of course, that is not the same every year, and that's how we can see that wet seasons might fail, or there might be floods and droughts, and so forth. Uh, and in the bottom picture here, and I apologize for the resolution, uh, you can see similar process, uh, but then over the oceans. Uh, and so with that we can see the gradual increase in, uh, in water in the oceans, but we can also see uh, temp temporary processes like El Nino pooling of water in particular areas uh, in the uh, Pacific, for instance. Uh, so we can, we can see an awful lot more than we could before with only electric magnetic method. And um, uh, I guess the main disadvantage is the, the coarse resolution. As you can see, it's all pretty sort of blurry image of the satellites, but it has taught us an enormous amount about uh, the Earth.